Welcome, welcome, welcome back to the Gill Athletics Connections podcast. Last week, we were able to learn and uplift and honor Shelton Irvin from Summer Creek High School. He was named the Boys High School Coach of the Year from our friends over at USTF CCCCA. I am proud, humbled. I'm going to give you the other side of it as well. Help me welcome the girls coach of the year from our good friends at USTF CCCA. Help me welcome Mr. Mike McCabe from Union Catholic High School. Mike, how are you today, sir? Very good. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. This is exciting. You know, uh, winning an award like this, you're kind of a big deal. <laughs> so uh, to help uh, share your story and kind of learn from you, what, to, what, how in the world did you win this award? I think there's a lot of value for uh, high school and college coaches that are out there. So I'm excited to uh, kind of dig in and see how it went this year. Cool. Sounds good. So Mike, how does one win the girls <laughs> coach of the year? This, so if you don't know, if you, if you weren't able to listen to last week, so USTCA and it's presented by the U S Marines, which we always got to give a shout out. We got several Marines at work for us. So we love the Marines. Thank you for sponsoring uh, these coach of the year awards to the USTF CCCA. Uh, our friends at the UST, there's so many initials here. The, our friends at the USTF CCCA got to get them all correct there. Uh, they name a head boys and head girls coach of the year for each state and then if that's not hard enough then out of those 50 each they pick the one coach of the year and mike you won the girls coach of the year award so how how, how did this year go what, what what do you think kind of led up to this award uh i, I guess a combination of things uh, I've, I've been lucky enough to i've won the, the the state award six or seven times i think i won it in its inception on the guy's side the first year and, and i've had the chance to the opportunity to win the girls, I think every year since. Um, so I guess my name has been in the hat more. So maybe that gives me a better opportunity to get this guy out of here. Um, so I think that's part of it. Uh, but, but I also think that, uh, you know, we, we had a, I, I feel like we had the most complete team uh, that we've ever had. Uh, we've had, maybe we've had teams with, that were pretty strong, like very strong and had a, a lot of firepower in certain event areas, but we covered every event this year uh, we scored at every event at our state meet, every field event, every track, every track event. So I think that, you know, that makes it more valuable. Wait, I want to make sure I heard that right. You scored in every single event? Yeah, at our at our state group meet, which is what I think they base some of the award off or a lot of the award off of is uh, we scored in every event, like all the field events, all throws, jumps, running. Yeah. I mean, I think that is the definition of a complete team. <laughs> Can you score in every single event? Holy cow. Yeah, and I think that's the first time we've done that. So, you know, we've had some, some, some amazing teams. Uh, we may have scored tons in the 400 and maybe nothing in a couple of the throws. So this right. the completeness of this team, I thought, was uh, if, if it's based, a lot of it's based on the team accomplishment, full team, full coaching staff, then this was a year where I think it was a deserving time. Yeah. And I certainly, I said this last week that, you know, I think these coach of the year awards, they're, they're amazing. Anything we can do to honor our coaches, I'm all for it. Uh, but these big coach of the year awards, I always think of them like less of a coach of the year, even though the head coach, certainly you've got a lot to do with it. You got to keep the whole game going, but it's a staff of the year award. I mean, you're not, you didn't do it because you had a singular athlete that, you know, did all this who were all, like you said, you had athletes in, in every event do that. Has that always been as, as the head coach there, has that always been kind of your mantra, a full team, or did it just kind of happen this time? Uh, in, in my early years, uh, the team was really small. So it was me and one other coach. And as we slowly progressed, uh, I learned too, I was a super young coach that if we were going to be successful uh, as a complete team, we were going to have to have a lot of, a lot of kids and a lot of really, you know, as many good coaches as we could get to make that happen, because there's no way one person can, or two people can even control a bunch of jumpers, hurdlers, sprinters, distance runners, and throwers. There's no way, and pole vault, right? There's just no way. So uh, I've been really lucky to to have a, a staff that's not enormous, but I, I have a staff that is able to, together, we work together really well to make it all happen and you know, cover all those event areas. Well, tell us a little bit about Union Catholic. I know you're in the great state of New Jersey. When I was a college coach, New Jersey was my recruited state. You know, that's where I went all the time. Uh, and, and absolutely loved it. I mean, what a, a tough weather environment, not a huge state for population. And yet the athletes that come out of New Jersey are just 
outstanding. So tell us a little bit about Union Catholic, you know, what kind of uh, size student body it is, and then tell us about that coaching staff of yours. Yeah, so uh, Union Catholics, we're in Scotch Plains, which is in central Jersey. We're about, uh, for track people, we're maybe 50 minutes from the New York Armory, so we're not too far away from there. Um, we have probably about 180 per grade, so about, um, you know, maybe we have four or 500 girls in the building, maybe three to 400 boys in the building. So that, that's the size. So we're not an enormous school, but we're a co-ed, uh, you know, Catholic school. Um, so that, that's what we are. And uh, we have a, we, we, you know, we got a track maybe 10 years ago. We didn't have a track when I started. So that was cool. And, and that helped a lot, especially in the field events, especially in the jumps. Uh, so that, that was a big piece for us. And, you know, and more importantly, uh, you know, we'll, you didn't ask, but uh, I've, I have a lot of support by our administration. Mm -hmm. So my, my principal, she's just like Sister Percy Lee's just always supported us. And, and, and she views it as a way to, for kids to, you know, she says, like, allow them to become like the best version of them that they can be. Right. So if the kid can excel in track and field, she'll do her best to help us give those kids the opportunity. And, you know, that could be in a, in a lot of other venues as well. Uh, so my admin's been great and, and my coaching staff's awesome. Uh, I have uh, Brian Kupnick. He's been with me. He was, he did a stint with me years ago and then he, he went to another school uh, for a teaching job. And now he's back here teaching at UC and coaching. So he works hand in hand with me with uh, the distance runners in the fall, uh, distance runners, winter, spring, and then he'll, he'll actually help with the jumps as well in the, in the track seasons. Uh, and then Jeff Ziegler's in the building and, and Jeff's, helps with the throws and he does the vault. So we, we've been lucky. We got lucky to have Jeff in here to actually have somebody who has knowledge in the vault. Really difficult. Uh, I have a former athlete, Braden, who uh, who helps with the sprints. And uh, we had a guy, Dave, start with us this year uh, who helps with the, the jumps and the hurdles. And, you know, with all that said, the, the culmination, I had a, a coach, Lewis, who's not with us anymore. Um, Maureen wasn't, isn't with us anymore. And Amir, who doesn't coach us anymore, but they all kind of molded these current kids uh and uh and last but not least and i saved him because he's been here even a year longer than me is uh, ed guzman uh, coaches the throws with us so ed was i think started coaching a year before me at uc as an assistant and then they asked me to take over the program uh, and, and ed's been you know with me or with me and here before me uh coaching so that that's my full staff this year was me plus five people and uh you know we we do the best we can you know like it's I'm sure every high school coach you know, has the challenges of, you know, just trying to make it all happen with all different kinds of kids and abilities and schedules and everything else. And, and we all coach both genders, which makes it even more challenging. I love how several of those coaches you talked about one distance coach also helped out with the jumps. One of the throws coaches also helped with the pole vault and maybe that was the other way around. Uh, but that's interesting, you know, that um, multi-talent coaching. So you're not just the distance coach, just the throws coach, just the uh, jumps coach. H how does that work in regards to their coaching education? H how does someone be a distance coach and a jumps coach? And what do they have to do to, to make that happen and make it work properly? Well, it's interesting. Like, uh, like Brian did, helps, you know, it was mainly a distance guy. I was a collegiate distance runner. But in high school, he did some triple jump. Like, I think it was when triple jump, like, just started in New Jersey. So he had some experience. And then, uh, you know, you, you can go, you know, take some courses, learn some stuff. And he had some experience doing the event. And, you know, it, it, Jeff happened to vault and throw jab when he was a, in college. So it kind of played in. And, uh, you know, in a perfect world, everybody gets to coach one event group. And, you know, or two people coach each event group and, and it's easy, but it's not easy. So just being forced to kind of bounce around, just like we ask kids to, to complete a team sometimes like, hey, why don't you try another event? Uh, it's, it's the same idea. Like, well, coach, I'm a really good whatever sprinter. Uh, why don't we try the long jump? And, and maybe you'll be good at the triple or why don't we just try the hurdles and see what happens? And, and sometimes that means the kid finds a new event that they're better at. And sometimes that means they're not good at other events and we just refocus on the others. Uh, yeah. So, so that those guys have been really receptive to, you know, kind of branching out, you know, to, to ultimately help the kids. That's what it's all about. Are there any, and I can't think of any, but you know, you're, you're a much better coach than I ever was. 
are, are there any negatives to a multidisciplinary coaching? So a coach that can go help out with some of the throws or some of the jumps, but their primary event is different. Any, any negatives there? Yeah. I mean, I mean, time, right? So, Hey, I'd love to have you work with the jab today, but listen, I really, I, I'm like, I really got to work on the vault. Okay, let's find another day. Mm -hmm. um, but that to me, like, this is high school track and field. And I, I don't know of too many schools that have staffs of 10 or 12 people. And, you know, we, we always want more quality people, but I always say it's, and I'm fortunate, it's hard to find, you know, quality coaches who, who can kind of work through our time schedule because a school time schedule is hard. You, you could have this person that would love, like, hey, man, I'd love to, you know, come coach your discus throwers. And I threw 200 feet in high school or college, but I work till four. Well, it just doesn't really work. Like I can't give you Saturdays or, you know, or you can't get to meets in time. So that's, that's part of the challenge. No, it's, that's, that's a big effect. I have that personal experience when I first moved here to Gill, uh, the local high school wanted me to help out. And well, I worked till five. I mean, these kids are done at practice at five, essentially, you know, and it just, we, we, we were doing practices at six thirty, six o'clock in the morning. And, you know, I came from the college environment where that was kind of more normal, but it was like, this is not fair. There's a bunch of 14 to 18 year old kids. Yeah. Uh, they, so they were doing, you know, hurdles and jumps practice with me in the morning and then coming back with their other coach in the afternoon. It was like, this ain't right, man. It's high school, <laughs> you know, yeah. maybe in college they should do that, but let's, you know, let's have them do other sports and other things. It, it was, it was really tough as much as I enjoyed them. I just, it wasn't fair to them. Uh, how do you, I'm really fascinated by the, by this multi-discipline coaching because you know, on the college level, we uh, primarily mainly get real deep in one event area, right? We're a sprints and hurdles coach, we're a distance coach. Uh, and all of our coaching education is centered around that, right? We'll go to UST, USTF CCCA academies and we'll do more distance if we're a distance coach. We'll go to USATF and we'll do level two endurance. Um, we'll go to clinics uh, and only do, go to the distance ones. Uh, but I've seen, I've noticed that coaches who have more longevity success actually kind of dabble in the others. You know, you'll see a distance coach at the throws and I'll be like, you know, what, what are you doing here? He's like, yeah, I just thought maybe I could learn something on the weightlifting side, like something for strength or explosiveness, which will help in steeplechase or the mile or half mile. Uh, how do you how do you help, how do you encourage your coaching staff in that route of, of multidisciplinary coaching? Well, yeah, part of it becomes need. So it's not like, Hey, you're going to have to do this, but Hey, what do you think about giving this a shot? I'm like, Oh, I don't know, but you know, I, I can take a run at it and see. And sometimes it, 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 we get in the jam some years and it means like, Hey, let's get our hands on a good instructional video. And I, I really believe that you know, coaching is teaching, right? So uh, the majority of the guys on my staff are teachers, you know, by trade. So you may not know the event inside and out yet, but if you understand it and you can apply what you know and teach it to the kids, even if it's basics, uh, a lot of high school kids only need the basics and then can slowly build out the other side. And, you know, there's some kids that are, you know, more elite and all that. And then, you know, then you take it steps further. And that might mean that the coach just has to, you know, the coach is challenged. Like our, our coaches, like same with me, like if, if we're like, hey, this kid's really good. I got to make sure that I'm doing what I need to be doing to make sure that I can take him or her to the next level. And that, that that's, you know, it, it's as simple as that, I think. Um, and I, it, it's the, the high school environment. Like, you know, I work at a private school, like, I, I do different things, you know, like I, I don't just, you know, like I have a lot that I do and, I, and that's like, I'm kind of a jack of all trades in a lot of ways. And so I, I feel like I can do that. And I, I don't, I don't do as much with the field events and I've done more with the hurdles in the last couple of years, but uh, I, I coach, like I coach cross country here and I, and I, and I, I ran distance and when I was younger and I sprinted in college. So my, my range and the running events is really good. And, and I really between what sprinters learn and are taught into the distance world, sometimes distance stuff into the sprint side, but I think there's a lot of value and crossover into it. And, uh, you know, we, we do stuff, there's certain stuff we do with our distance kids that we might do with a jumper or a sprinter uh, and just understanding how they all come together is important. 
That's a great point. You know, we're, we're teachers first, right? So you're teaching roughly eight to three o'clock and then practice and then grading uh, uh, papers and such at night. Oh, and, you know, family and personal life and everything else that, you know, those things kind of just get in the way of coaching, by the way, just, you know, throw, throw those to the wayside. Yeah. Um, so it's a great point about, you know, our, on the college level, maybe we have more time to go deeper into some other events, mm -hmm. uh, but on the high school level, man, we've got so much more to do that's not just focused on track doesn't make one better than the other it just makes them different in their um, time commitments of each of those things so talk to us about this year you are named coach of the year the national coach of the year you've been named the new jersey coach of the year several times in fact you're telling me before we hit record you were just introduced into the union catholic hall of fame as well so you've done a lot of great things obviously they don't give those things out for that there's no participation trophies for hall of fames and coach of the years and that's why i have zero of them by the way so that's that's uh, it's a big deal that you have those what led to this year what was uh, kind of special about this year that culminated in this amazing award uh i i think it's it's pretty rewarding this year because as everyone had to deal with it was such a challenge so you know having being shut down you know uh, mid mid march um for COVID uh, and losing, uh, I think it was right before our national meet indoor and then the entire outdoor season and then not even seeing our cross kids until maybe late July. Uh, it was just, a, you know, as everyone lived with a complete pause and, you know, it was a challenge. We had an abbreviated cross season. We, we had this like cut down indoor season where we, we couldn't meet with the kids until I think February 1st in New Jersey, we're usually meeting with the kids for a cross, they start the season like the Monday before Thanksgiving. So the, it was a much different feel, a much different build. Uh, we, we do a lot of work with our, historically, we do a lot of work with our sprinters and jumpers and, and even our throwers and stuff indoors in the winter and, our, and sometimes our distance kids, but we try to keep them outside in the winter uh, and we weren't allowed inside to train. So that put a whole new piece into it. So by the time we started in February, uh, it had snowed a bunch. Uh, so we couldn't get on our track and the only thing we could do is train in the parking lot. And it's something we may have never done. I mean, so, so we would go out and wheel out distances and take chalk and chalk stuff down, put cones down. And, and that's how it started. And I, I do believe that, you know, when I was in college, we did the majority of our sprint work outdoors in the winter in, in PA, but, uh, it was different, right? So it was a different challenge for the kids. Uh, there was a lot less racing uh, in the um, the progression was different. So if, if I'm accustomed to kind of how I handle things every year as far as how we peak and how we prepare and, you know, we want to be our best towards the end, uh, I kind of, for, you know, doing this for 18 years, I, I kind of know how I want to do that. And this past year was completely different. And one thing I'm really proud of is I, I thought we just ran and competed so well at the national meet in Eugene, like it just came together even better. Like we had a great state meet and we, we ended the back end of the season well, and we just had such a great meet at the end of the year that to me, like a week or two later, as I reflected on it, I just felt really good about, you know, I, I it was planning and it was luck, you know, like things have to fall into place. Um, but, but I do, I think it's a rewarding year because of the challenges tied into it. And then the adjustments, uh, we as coaches had to make as our staff and also the adjustments that our kids had to make. And, and probably even more so is the strain it put on our parents because we're a private school. So kids may come from as far as like 40 minutes, some live two minutes away. So if, if we're on a hybrid schedule and a student isn't in school, you know, two days a week or three days a week in their home, and then we're like, hey, we have practice at three o'clock, somebody's got to drive them. You know, in the past, it may be, okay, they bust in the morning, mom and dad pick them up later after work. So now it's like, hey, can you drop your kid off at three o'clock? So I, I, I think it's, it's rewarding for our staff, our kids, uh, myself, and um, hopefully for our parents that, you know, I hope, I hope they can take some pride in the fact that, you know, I got this award, but it, it really is a, a school-based award um, because the, the sacro and I've thanked them so many times, like the sacrifice of our parents to make it happen um, is really special.
if you're not watching on YouTube and you're listening on the podcast, I want to point out that when coach said, I won this award, he did air quotes. And I love that. Cause I think what, what you're doing there might correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, it's not, I it's not even, you know, we, we talked about the coaching staff, but it's a combination, right? Coaching staff, athletes, administration, parents, maybe the community is involved as well. It's, uh, these awards are, um, you'd have to make a hundred little ones to give out to all the people and maybe more <laughs> that actually made up the, the big trophy there. You, you mentioned, uh, you know, I think track coaches specifically track coaches, uh, are some of the most resourceful, uh, flexible, uh, intelligent people there are. Uh, we get kicked off our track at random times and have to still do a practice. We, you mentioned, you know, 10 years ago, you got a facility. So before that you had to figure out how to do long jump practice and shot put practice and things like that without a track. So you were real flexible with all the disruptions. That's, that's such a kind way of saying it, right? The disruptions that COVID <laughs> occurred, right? Uh, but all these disruptions that were happening and, you know, you're doing more outdoors, you're chalking. I, I love all that resourcefulness. As you go into this season and next and the future, are there anything that you learn that you will continue on? Like, was there a, a really cool uh, parking lot workout that you're like, you know what, I know in 2025, you know, we can be on our track, but this, this workout, something was there. We're going to keep this workout. Anything like that, that you'll carry through. Well, I, I think not so much workout, but mm -hmm. one thing that I, I don't mind, and it just depends on the year, but I, I think there's some value in, in being outdoors anyway. Um, uh, part of that's just because being in the halls practices take forever. Um, and, but, but, I think what one major thing that is it was forced and, and it's good and sometimes it's hard, especially with the younger high school kids and experienced kids is we were forced to race less. So, you know, in the college level, right, you know, you race every two weeks or whatever, you know, indoors in New Jersey, New York area, you, you can find a meet every day of the week, right? You can, there's a meet at the armory almost every night, you go to ocean breeze, we got the bubble, you just, you could always find a meet. So one thing that I, that I found, which I always kind of knew was, uh, you know, the racing less for a lot of these kids, especially like your, your upper tier kids, long-term in this season, in their career, post high school, if they keep running and, and competing is better for them. Um, there's definitely value in competition. A lot of it, especially when they're young, I think sometimes it's just good to get them out there to see it, feel it, learn it, love it, you know? or hate it. And, uh, and, uh, so, so what, one major thing is, and I'm going to try to apply it this summer, this winter is we're, we're going to really try to space things out a bit more. Um, and with our distance group, I, I've already just talked to Brian yesterday or this week about just some ways we're going to attack, you know, our indoor season differently. So we, we can come outside and, and be, as fresh as we want to be. And, and I've always thought we did a pretty good job with it, but I think we can be a little bit more patient in some of our, in some of our competition stuff. So I would say that's a, a pretty big takeaway for me. Um, and then just being away from the sport, from the period, from, from coaching and in my regular schedule, uh, that taught me a lot. It, it, I stepped away. I think, you know, I realized after that I needed that break because I'm, I'm a three season guy for 18 years. So uh, I think it was really good for me, my family, you know, my, my son's 13, my daughter's nine. So it was a good time for me to, to get a little bit of a breather, spend more time with them, um, get the break from coaching. And it, and it did definitely like, and at first I went through the moments, like I'm sure every coach did of like, maybe I just, we'll stop coaching. Like, this is pretty nice. Like when I go teach and I'm done at two 30, like I can come home and hang out with the kids, go to their games and stuff. And, and then the bug, you know, and then I really, I'm going like, so my wife's going stir crazy. And, and I knew that it was time to get back. And once I got back in the groove, I had more energy and, and I even more appreciation to be back in to do it again. So, um, yeah. When there was no outdoor season, you know, last, last year or whatever. Now uh, I was going to do a coach's best lawn award because everybody was finally home <laughs> in the spring that they could focus on their yard work. Right. So uh, probably the yards were the best they ever looked back in uh, 2020. <laughs> uh, the, the amount of uh, stuff I got done at my house. Uh, unbelievable. And I was in, I got myself in good shape because 
I actually took time for myself. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, that's great. You know, I, I think that's hugely important is our coaches mental health and mental well being because we we always talk about and this is one of the reasons on our podcast here, you know, we don't talk about X's and O's because there are so many amazing resources for that, right? We talked about USATF and USTFCCA, Altus podcast, Ryan Banta's podcast. I mean, there's just so many great resources to learn how to help a distance runner be faster, long jumper farther, et cetera, right? But we don't talk a lot about the coach as the person, right? It's always Coach McCabe. Coach, what are you doing here? What, how'd this happen? Not, hey, Mike, how are you doing? You know, how are you doing on financial health for retirement one day? You, you want to retire one day, right? Uh, yeah, I don't know if that'll ever happen, but I'd yeah, like to, yeah. I said want, not definitely going to happen. I, I know that one. Yeah, yeah. You look at the, <laughs> I know the stock market looks like it's going great. I'm not doing so well for some reason, so I'm going to have to work <laughs> even longer. Uh, but, you know, your financial health, your relationship health, your relationship with your spouse and your family, you talked about your children, that is hugely important. And if you don't take care of that, well, then the coaching's going to suffer. It, it just, it will. You may have a lot of success for some amount of time, five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years it will suffer if you're not taking care of the core tenets of your person, your family, your friends, your uh, maybe your spiritual health as well. You know, just things like that. They're so important. And we don't talk about those things, unfortunately. Uh, and we need to, we need to make that more common uh, out there. And that's why on the podcast here, we talk about, you know, your journey and mentors that poured into you uh, and not, Hey man, how did you score a point in every field of, or every uh, event right. on the track? You know, that, that's cool. And I love that, by the way, uh, that's super that's a great fact. I love that. Uh, but you know, taking care of yourself, man, it's, it's important. So I'm glad you, you know, from a very bad situation here with coronavirus, you were able to take some good things away from it, not only personally with, you know, getting in shape and spending time with your family and friends and things like that, but also like, Hey man, like I learned something about how we coach and how we direct our team. Like maybe we need to compete less or, you know, be more intentional with how we compete. It, what a lost opportunity if you let this bad stuff that happened and is happening go by and you don't learn and grow from it. So uh, hats yeah. off to you, man, for, for growing for them and your staff growing for it. So that's amazing. So I uh, mentioned that, um, you know, I think it's just so <laughs> what, what a fact that you scored a point in every stinking event that is, th there should be an award for that, by the way, uh, as you were uh, named the, the girls national coach of the year. How, how did they actually, I don't think I asked Shelton this. How did you actually find out that you won the award? Is it like publishing clearinghouse style? Do they show up with a big, uh, I was going to say a check, but we know, we know that ain't true, but you know, do they show up with balloons and stuff or how, how do you actually find out? Um, I, I got a call. I just, I got a phone call one morning um, and uh, it was simple as that. And I'm so, I'm not always the best with names of people I've only met and is a, a big, big time guy through USTF CCCA and he was great. Um, and I uh, can't believe the, the name eludes me, but uh, it's uh, pro probably either Sam or Mike. I think it was Mike Corn. Yeah. Mike Corn. Yeah. yeah. Shout out Mike Corn. Love him. And, yeah. Yeah. He's great. And yeah, just the call and congratulate me. It was super gracious. And I mean, it was just like, a, I think I came back from practice or something and it was, you know, in the summer and it was the morning and it was cool. You know, I, I you know, it just, it was cool. And it just had just happened quick. I didn't, I didn't know it was coming or anything. So yeah, nobody, nobody came with like a, a sign, but the phone call was more than enough. Did you at least celebrate? Did you have like your favorite meal for dinner that night or something? Did you like tell the wife like, Hey, we got to go out for Outback Steakhouse, whatever <laughs> your favorite is. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, I'm not a huge like celebration guy, but we, we did some, like, like our family kind of like my family and my parents and stuff. Like we celebrate a little bit, just like, you know, had dinner and stuff and like a cake or something, but it, it was nice. And do you, you said you're not a celebration guy, but do you wear like the award, the award's really cool. Uh, but do you wear the award like a necklace sometimes? Like you just kind of walk around the hallways, like, Hey, you want to join track? I did not get the award yet. So oh. should I wear it once I get it? Is 100%. That, that's what uh, everyone does. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, gosh, what's his name? I gum it. Uh, who's my guy with the clock? I'm so embarrassed. Oh uh, yeah. Flavor Flav. Yeah. Thank you. Oh my gosh. I had easy E in my head. That's uh, <laughs> someone's yelling at me right now from the podcast. Oh my gosh. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Flavor Flav style, man. Wear that around. Like when you go to recruit kids for the team, you're like, look, man, this is what happens on our track team. You come join us. Yeah. I don't know what it is. I thought it was just some sort of like trophy or something. I don't, I don't even know what it is. It is, but you got to modify. Come on. You're a oh, coach. Geez. You can figure this out. I know you can. I know you can. <laughs> 
Uh, hey, one of the things that we, we learned from Shelton was the uniqueness about Texas high school track and field, kind of like how you qualify for state and things like that, super unique. Uh, I don't know fully, but I do know that New Jersey has some uniqueness as well. Maybe uh, you could help us understand the New Jersey system, indoor and outdoor, kind of help us, you know, someone in Alabama right now is like, yeah, you just go to areas and regionals and then you go to state, right? I know it's a little different there. At right, right. So, so the way it works in New Jersey, uh, they have a, we have a section. So it, it works from, t- from top down, it works like this. There's a, what they call like an all-group state championship, which is the meet of champions. That's not team scored. That's just qualifiers for like, a, you know, your ultimate, you know, they have like other sports, they have tournament champions. So your best miler in New Jersey, in theory, wins that race. Uh, to qualify for that, you, your certain amount of qualifiers out of your group championship. So your group championship is like your, that's your state championship. There are six groups in New Jersey. So there's a, a non-public A, which is what we're in. That's the larger uh, non-public schools. Is it non-public B? And then there's a group one, two, three, four, four being the largest, and then working its way down one being the smallest. And then to qualify for the group, you have to get out of your section. And then there's sections. And I think I don't work too much out of sections. We usually have two sections and the publics either have four or six sections with feet, which feed into the group. So you go to your sectional. If you get like top six, you make your group and then out of your group, it's like top two. And then they have what they call wild cards to make me to champions this year, which was uh, we haven't seen in years was the non-publics didn't have a section this year because the numbers were a little bit smaller because of COVID. And we usually only have two sections at the non-publics. So what they did was they had, and, and when I started coaching, this is probably 10-ish years ago, maybe a little more now, they didn't have a sectional ever. So we would just go right into our group meet. So we, we were allowed to bring three athletes per event. So we would bring like our three, what we thought our three best athletes were per event. And, you know, they score six deep in New Jersey, right? So college is eight, they score six deep. Um, so this year we, we went back to not having a section and we may not next year because there's less non-public schools than there were. The numbers are a little smaller and people debate, like, do you need the section? Do you not need the section? I think there's pros and cons to both. Um, they named sectional champions like kind of retroactively. So if, if my kid got second place at the group meet, but the girl who beat her was from the other section, my girl would get a gold retroactively for winning her section, but the group would be a silver. And for our group meet, that's how we like won our state championship meet. Um, So it was a little funky this year, but normally it goes section qualifies to group group qualifies to mid champions and your state champions are your group champions. So in football, I think we have like, it's, it's like funny, like we have tons of group, like, champions like I don't even know how many we don't have football at school but there's there's tons of people joke or there's tons of football state champions in New Jersey but there'd be 16 state champions when it's all said and done and and we're, we're in a pretty challenging group G- generally um group four is probably the most competitive uh, it's the largest schools and then usually non-public a group three and sometimes non-public a is it would be harder to win than than four even just depends on the year but we always have a like, good um centralized talent in uh in non-public a so sectionals to group and group would be what more uh traditional we'd be called the state that's your state that's your state championship you're getting your individual awards but you're also there's a a team title to it yeah so like when when i said we we scored in every event we scored in every event at our group state championship right yeah okay good perfect gotcha and then they do so then they say okay screw groups and size of schools we're going to take the best of everybody to this meet of champs and it's not team scored but it is the best miler in every one of those groups and the best shot putters and everybody they come together and compete yeah and that's a great meet like the meet of champions and they have that um they have that indoor and outdoor and then in cross country they do have a meet they do have a team champion at the meet of champions as well Um, yeah and it it makes sense because if they did, some people want a team score at the meet of champions in track. Um, I don't really agree with it because like when Sydney was here, we, we could have just won the meet because she could have won three events and you walk away, right? Because it becomes so watered down right. that one elite athlete could win the meet for you. Mm-hmm. So it's not really saying my team is better. It's saying we have one athlete that can beat your team. 
Yeah, kind of like that um, up there, you guys on the college level have like, uh, I've never even been to this meet, but the ECAC, IC4A, and it has like 100 teams in it. But because it has oh, yeah. 100 teams in it, the the overall point total is less because less people are less people from each school, I guess, are scoring because again, you have a hundred schools going at it. Yeah. Makes sense. And and you only, you said you only score six deep for your state, your group championships. Yeah. So they go 10, eight, six, four, two, one, but, but on the hundred meter dash, you'll have eight people to the final. Correct. Well, I can't tell if that's like, so like brutal, like, sorry, two people who made the finals, you ain't scoring. Or if it's like, man, you're leaving like everybody, I think everybody else does eight lanes, eight places, eight, eight points. That's interesting. Has there ever been discussion about that? Uh, not that I've heard of. And, and now that you say it, it's, it's interesting. I, I, when I was in college, it was a deep. I, I wonder if it's more of a non-change because they used to do six because tracks were six lanes, mm-hmm. right? So like maybe they just haven't changed yet, um, but they definitely don't score that deep. I, I think I've like run the numbers. Like when we, when we go a mile split, they'll do like a, Miles but can do like a virtual meet for you if you're trying to do like a quick look like hey how do we stand and then usually i'll sit down and kind of score the meet myself uh, but the virtual meet uh initially the default is to score at eight deep so a lot of times you'll hit it and you'll forget to switch it and you'll get a score and then when you switch it to six it's generally very close but i think there's value in thinking about going eight deep because it just especially in high school even it, it gives more kids an opportunity to be a part of the the team is a score right Right. And that um, system of sectionals and groups and then meet of champs, uh, is that for indoor and outdoor? Yeah. So indoor, they have sectionals as well. And then we, we, we do not have it as non-publics. We don't have sectionals indoor. We never have. And because less non-public schools will participate in an in indoor track. Mm-hmm. But you still have a group slash state champion and then a meet of champs. Yeah. So we'll, yeah. So for the non-publics, we'll walk right into like, I said before, like we'll have our, our, our group state championship meet and we're allowed to bring instead of like qualifying kids through, right. uh, we bring three. Yeah, I, I love the meet of champs idea. I wish every school that had more than one division, which I think is fairly every state. No, I think Indiana still does one division. It don't matter if you got 100 kids in the school or oh, wow. 3000, you line up and go. Yeah. Illinois, where we're located at for the longest time had two divisions, which I really like big school, small school, line up and rock and roll. Uh, and then recently, maybe about six, seven, eight years ago, they went to a three uh, class system. But you know, I grew up in Alabama and started my coaching career in Alabama. You know, there are more people in Chicago than there is like in the whole state of Alabama, right? Uh, and in Alabama, back then we had six classes. Wow. So think about slight. Oh yeah. There were kids that was like, like, well, what are you doing here, man? <laughs> like, well, what do we do? Why don't we just put you two together? You one A and two A, like race you together. You'll be it's much more competitive. So I love that meet of champs idea. Yeah. I know other places have tried it. Texas has a meet of champs and stuff like that. It's that's the way to go. That's the real like step on the track and let's see who's the fastest, who's the farthest. Uh, and, and you get like, you really get to see some amazing performances. I mean, it, it, it may the bang for your buck. So like in, in a few hours you get to see, it's just like back to back to back to back. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, cause there might be two heats a mile. Right. So, and that heat's going to be the, the, the slower heat. That first heat is still going to be good. Cause someone in there probably didn't run as fast as they wanted to on the qualifier and they're trying to get on the podium. So some kid will like, I'm trying to run four ten solo. They go out in 60 and try to come and then the next heat is awesome. So right. you just kind of like back to back. It, it's a lot of, it's a lot of fun. It's cool. That's cool. That's cool. So what is it, you know, you're, you've been coaching in New Jersey and specifically at UC for 15 plus years now. I, and I told you, you know, I recruited New Jersey when I was a college coach and I was just always blown away by, I mean, not the good number of good athletes, the number of great athletes that come out of New Jersey every stinking year. What is it about a New Jersey kid that just makes fosters these like amazing track athletes. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I mean, is, is part of it um, just that we're so densely populated? I mean, there's more bodies like we're, we're in Union County. So um, there's a lot of, there's, you know, more people per square mile, right? Like we have more bodies. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, is, is part of it that the, the state is pretty competitive and when you're put into environments it's like Texas football, right? When you're, when you're put into environments where the competition is really strong, everyone's going to raise their game, right? So when you see like, 
you know, when you're some high school junior, you're like, I want to score at the state meet. Well, if it takes two flat to score at the state meet, you're probably aiming for that. If it takes 155, you're probably aiming for that. And, and, and I've seen that just within our own team. And I, I reference, you know, we had some strong boys teams years ago. And I remember we had a boy who could run split 45, another one ran 47. So if I'm a freshman and I'm like, hey, he's really good. He ran 45. He ran 47. I can run 49 at least. But if my best guy runs 50, the kid might be like, oh, maybe someday I'll run 51. I'm not as good as him. And the same thing works with our girls. It's cyclical. Like when when Sid was around, we had a, a bunch of really great 400 meter runners. Uh, and I think we have the second, I think we're the second fastest four by four in national history. Well, she's running super fast. So the barrier, the mental barriers of a girl saying like, well, my PR is only 57. I probably can't go fast. And that was, hey, she runs 51. I could probably run 55 or 54. And then it's just, I think it's the same idea. So the competition just funnels itself uh, in, in miles, you know, looking at miles split and, oh, well, that kid in Florida ran, you know, 151. Like, I, I want to be, uh, if he can do it, I, I'm going to try to do it. You know, like, and that's part of it too. But yeah, I, I don't know what the, the, listen, it's crazy. Like, Sid won the Olympics, Moo won the Olympics, Moo's an hour from us, right? right, like, right. Yeah. I mean, and there's more that I'm forgetting, you know, there's just, it's, it's really, and Ajay Wilson, right? Like, she's unbelievable. She's from an hour from us, Neptune, you know, it's unbelievable. You know, th those three women themselves are probably all live where they grew up, probably within an hour of each other. Wow. I mean, it's unbelievable. I love that, you know, the description you're talking about, you know, kid has a decision if someone's running really fast in their area or group or in the state and they're like, well, well, maybe I can run that fast or they can decide the other route and be like, you know what, maybe I should join the golf team. Maybe, maybe this track stuff ain't for me. <laughs> I need another event. <laughs> Well, coach, as we start to wrap up uh, again, congratulations, man. I mean, this is amazing. Please tell your staff this is this is all about them. And I love how, you know, you're giving shout outs to the administration, your parents. I mean, it, it really is that community award. So uh, congratulations to the entire Union Catholic community for um, building up because it's also not a one year award, right? Like this didn't come out of the blue. You had to build up the, the yeah. program. So um, it was a long time coming, I guess, is the best way to say it. But congratulations to all of you. Let's Thank learn you. a little bit about you. What's your track background? Are you a Jersey kid yourself? Are you one of those kids that someone was on your team running 410? And you're like, well, I'm going to run 410. Uh, what's your background in track and field? And how did you get into this great sport? Um, I, I grew up in, in Westfield, which is just a town over from Scotch Plains. Um, and I just went to like a, a local Holy Trinity grammar school in, in town. And my, my dad, well, I guess, I guess my dad started the sports program there. Um, I, I don't, I have older siblings and, and I'm a bit younger. So he had started the sports program even before I was born and, and he coached the track team. So I used to, used to and he, he liked track. My dad, you know, ran in high school a little bit and he enjoyed the sport. So I, I used to just tag along when I was young, like probably in kindergarten or first grade, I would just go right? Like jump in the car and go. And I think like in second or third grade, I would just jump in and run with groups. Not because my dad told me to, just because I was like, can I go? And he's like, I guess so. I'm like, sure. And that's, that's where it started. Um, so I always, and then I played a lot, a lot of soccer and basketball and then I just, I was a kid who loved sports. Uh, and then when I went, when I went to high school, um, I went to um, St. Joe's Metuchen, which is uh, about maybe 10, 15 minutes from UC. It was 20 minutes from my house. And, and that's kind of where my parents wanted me to go and which was fine. And I, and I got lucky because I had a really great uh, a freshman coach um, who was just so, he was a brother actually. And he was just so into it, brother rich. Um, and I, I, then I still thought I was going to play soccer. Uh, and I, I didn't, you know, I didn't know the rules and that's okay. Like I, they, in, they invited us to cross country in the summer and I, I just went to the practices and, I, I did real well. I think I, I ended up winning our like little freshman time trial. And then I remember one day school was starting saying like, Hey, when does soccer start? I'll do that too. And you only allowed one sport. And they said, Oh, you can only do one sport. And that was it. You know, I, I like soccer a lot, but I, I also had a lot of history in my, in running and uh, I figured it was time to change. And I, I got lucky because I had a, a real good freshman coach that was so into it. And I, I said, I referenced, I won that time trial. I was pretty good. By the time I finished my freshman fall, 
brother Richard recruited like three or four kids out of like homerooms. Uh, and I was like the number four or five freshman. And we had this awesome team, which was so cool. You know, like, yeah, did I want to be the best guy? Sure. But I had this awesome team. It was great. And I, I think I learned a lot there that you can just, there's, and most of those kids never ran, you know, maybe they played another sport. And uh, my experience there was good. You know, just like any kid, I was, you know, a lot of kids you see, I was probably five feet tall when I walked in and I walked out almost six feet. So got hurt a lot because I was growing. And my junior and senior year, it, I, I really learned to, to love it. And uh, Mr. Trojanowski, coach, was, was my coach my, and my bio teacher. And he was such a great guy. And he was a great runner. Like he ran a Villanova, was like a 151 high school runner at St. Joe's. Oh, wow. Um, and I think had like a world record at one point, like the four by by 15 at Villanova four by mile and uh but but you know what I what I really took away from it was the the bonds and the relationships I built with my teammates my junior and senior year um that are like you know some of my you know closest friends from high school they are for sure and I was just I felt blessed to have good friends from there and we had just this unbelievable team uh, we won a couple state titles and we just, when I looked at it, when I started coaching, I was like, Oh my God, like, we had so many, like we had like a shot putter, go to Clemson, two guys go to Navy. Like, Oh wow. We covered, you know, we just covered so well. So, so that's, that, that's just kind of how it all unfolded. And when I was in high school, I think my senior year in the, in the winter, I, with my good friend, Tim, I, we, we coached, uh, um, like a fifth and sixth grade basketball team at Holy Trinity where we both went and we just did that to help out and we love basketball and so whatever and that's how it went and then I went to St. Joe's University in Philadelphia and I walked on and I remember I didn't know if I really I wanted to run but I didn't know if I could be on the team like I was going there regardless that was my choice and my running sorry what were did you go there? Where were you at coaching wise? Did you go there? Like, what'd you go to study? Did you did you think at this time you wanted to be a coach, or what was your career path as you go to St. Joseph's? Yeah, no, not at all. I think I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Sure. Um, I, I I loved athletics and sports. Uh, in my brain, I thought maybe I could do something like physical therapy or athletic training. Um, and it manifested into uh, I ended up being a an IT major. So my undergrad is in management information systems i was always just real good with me, with computers and like tech work and all that and that's what it became uh but yes yeah, so i went there and i and i was you know mike levin was my coach and i remember i had a good end of senior year of high school and my dad i said dad i, I think i want to run and he's like i'll call the coach i wasn't recruited at all and he called coach glavin and he said he's welcome to walk on which is cool because not all schools allow that and that was it. And I, and I ran cross country my freshman year. Cause in high school I ran, you know, I ran, I think whatever, I don't know, 158, 432 split 50 ran mid 16s for 5k. So I ran cross and it was a really tough season for me. I, I think the distance was a little too much. And mm. uh, to his credit, coach Glavin pushed me down into like more of a middle distance group. And at one point I had a necessity, they threw me on some four by fours and I ended up running well. And he shifted me down and I ended up sprinting my four years there and uh, like highlights being, I think I was lucky enough to, uh, I was on like an all East four by four, my sophomore year, wow. um, which was, I think I see four A's. We got like third, fourth or fifth. I don't remember anymore. And uh, we won a bunch of a 10 four by fours. And then I think my senior year I, indoors, I was, I was third in the 500 at a tens and third in the 400 at a tens uh, outdoor, which was, was a lot of fun and a great experience. Yeah. And the, the coaching mixed into it was, in the summers of college, I would coach like these little like rec slash travel basketball teams with my friend just for fun. Like we, some of the kids we had coached at the at Holy Trinity were older and we would do that for fun. And uh, I kind of thought in my head, maybe someday I'll coach basketball or something. Who knows why, you know? And, um, but I, I enjoyed the coaching. And then I went and I graduated college. And I got a job with the, the federal district court in Newark. Um, and I, I was a, um, a computer tech for the judges, right? So for the federal judges. And I was doing that, great work, great people. Um, but I had like an itch to coach. And I, I got a, a JV basketball coaching job at Union Catholic. And that's how it started. 
Um, cause I was done coaching the summer stuff. Those kids were aging up to go to college and stuff. And I just had an itch to still like work with kids and, and I was a pretty good basketball coach. So I, I just applied kind of blind to UC. And, uh, from there they hired me and I coached basketball for three, four, five years. And, um, RAD then Jim Regan, uh, senior, he, one day was like, Hey, I know you ran in college, you know, would, would you be willing to coach the track team? Uh, we don't have anybody. And then, you know, this was probably just a few weeks out. I was like, I don't know, maybe, you know, so I did it. And, and my, my wife, Mary uh, coached with me. She, she ran at St. Joe's as well. Oh, and, wow. um, it started with maybe, 15, 20, maybe 20 kids and probably five of them quit because they thought it was too hard. Uh, you know, you have to come to practice every day. And, um, and that's where it went. And, and then I, it just manifested into, I didn't necessarily plan on coaching necessarily the next year. I was still coaching hoops and uh, I, I ran with some of the guys in the summer. There were a few good kids in there and I ran with some of the guys in the summer and I asked Jim if, I could help out in the fall and it, it just the way things fleshed out uh, he ended up hiring me as the head boys and girls cross country coach there was some movement in, in the staff and uh and then i helped through the winter and through the spring and then it just slowly but surely like built into what it was you know that that's really how it happened and i, I think at the root of it all um i i really enjoyed um and i still do uh the interactions with sort of that age group. I, I don't think I'm necessarily as good with younger, younger kids. I, I, I feel like I connect really well with kind of like that, whatever, 13 to 18 plus population, I guess, of athlete. And uh, the, the relationships were good. And, and, I, and I just think I, I have, a, I can teach and I, I it's a relationship sort of, uh, it's, it's the art I view it as. Like, I think I'm pretty good at at reading a person or an athlete and being able to help them figure out how to help them be their best version of themselves. And that's, that's what I think I enjoy the most. I, you know, full disclosure, I think when I was younger, I was probably trying to prove something as a coach, like, Oh, I can do this. I'm good. And after a few years, uh, I, I realized that it wasn't at all about me and that it was really, all about the kids and, uh, and just, and I noticed like, I always took pride in the idea that I helped them get better and I didn't want any of the credit and I still don't like, I just want them to be the best version of themselves and to, to learn skills that will help them forever. You know, like being on time to practice, working hard when, when things get hard, like, Oh, I've had five bad races in a row. Like, what are your options? You want to quit the team? You want to give up or, you want to let's try to formulate some sort of strategy to help you get better and, and get over the hump. Um, and, and that's, that, you know, that's kind of my, my story, I guess. If you're listening right now, I want you to hit rewind about 60 to 90 seconds. Cause something you said there, Mike, and I was going to, I was going to mistakenly say, Hey, all young coaches need to hear that again, but you know, let's make sure we're checking ourselves at all stages of our careers. You said, you know, when I was young, I'm paraphrasing here, Mike, you said yeah. when I was young, um, you know, I thought I could do it all, that it was all about me. And I was the one who was going to I'm putting my own words here a little bit. I was the one who was going to make them great coach or great athletes. And then you realized, oh, it's not about me. It's about them. What, what can I pour into them? Boy, go back and listen to Mike say that and think about where you are and how you interact with your athletes. Uh, and I think that goes for your staff and administrators that those, that whole community uh, effect here, how are you pouring into others? Uh, and are, are you tilted maybe uh, somewhat too much to the ego side? That's what you're explaining. There's the ego side of life. Yeah. Uh, what, you know, you got into coaching for a reason. It was not to win awards. Those are byproducts. And again, they're not the byproduct necessarily of you. They're a byproduct of a community. Uh, so just go back and listen to that. I thought that was really, really poignant the way you said that, Mike. Uh, Mike, before I let you go, man, I got to give get one more value out of you, man. You've done uh, given us so much value here today, and I'm just so thankful for that. As coaches that are listening right now, I don't care what level, high school, club, college, professionals, uh, you know, you got a platform now that you're the big dog, you're the national coach of the year here, right? What advice would you give? Uh, and let's keep it targeted towards high school since that's where our, our expertise lies here with you. What, you know, high school coaches listening right now, they're trying to build a program. 
Um, they're trying to get more participation. They're trying to score in every event at the state meet. That's still an amazing feat to me. That's awesome. Uh, what kind of advice do you have for the coaches that are listening now for their program development? Well, I'll, I'll try not to go too long. I, I think, especially if it's it's from if you're coming from very you know very little success, uh, I, I would say, and this is what I did uh, initially. Uh, maybe just put your focus into not everything at once. So, you know, hey, we have a few good distance kids. We have a, a pretty good 100 kid who can long jump. Try to maximize um, the abilities in those events. And then as the program builds and you recruit kids out of your building, then you can expand a little bit more in the event areas. I, I, I believe that you, you have to, like, the kids need to see some success in order to like want to do it because it's a hard sport. And if, if, if you have just one or two kids who have success, a couple of their friends might say, Hey, you know, Jimmy is, he's doing so well. Like, I think I want to try. And if five kids come out because of that one kid, one or two of them are probably going to help somewhere. A couple won't and that's okay. Um, so I'd say initially, um, you know, centralize what you're doing. And then just like start something strong, centralized and just try to expand. And I, and I guess I alluded to it before. I, I think that it, it's just really important to know that and, and, and to know that, which I didn't know in the beginning. And, and you spoke about a little bit earlier is when I was younger, um, I, I would, you know, reach out to all different great coaches like, hey, like what, what, what are the workouts like? Like, what do you do? What's this? And the really good coaches will tell you exactly what they do. And I think, I think I'm getting these like amazing nuggets, which was all helpful. Um, but I'm sure that they knew then what I know now is like the training is so important and, and the way it's periodized and set up is so important, but there's no magic formula. There's no secret to the success. Like you have to, you have to, it's art. So you have to be able to apply this great plan that you got from the greatest coach in the world that you think is going to work. Will it work for, if I have five, 800 runners, is it going to work for all five? Is it going to work for one, two, three, none of them? Do I scrap it and try something else? And you, you have to be able to use the art and to evolve. And I think that's sometimes I evolve almost too fast. Like I'm willing to try different things because I know that not one thing will work for everyone. So just, just the ability to evolve and, and grow with the kids and, and make the kids the priority. And, um, you know, I, every, every coach has different goals and ideas. And, you know, one of my goals with our teams is to be successful and to win, but it's not at all costs. Um, it's, I, I don't put a kid in four events every week just to get a bunch of points. Um, we try to help the kids be successful and put them in positions to be successful and healthy. Um, so, you know, it's, it, you put the kids first, teach them life lessons through all of that and, and be willing, like you said before, you have to be flexible, right? Like these are high school kids that have a million things going on and things going through their heads and letting them know that, you know, I think at the end of the day, I could ramble forever, but maybe the most important thing of all of it is they have to know that you care about them. And if they know that you care about them, not just because like, Hey, that's the fastest kid I've ever coached because like, I want you to be the best version of you. And I've been blessed to coach some, maybe the best female high school girl ever. And um, she's great. I love her. And she's a hard worker and I care about her. And if I have the worst kid on my team quit that bothers me mm -hmm. right i want them to have fun i want them to learn and i want them to enjoy it and i always feel like it's on me i, I take it personally when they leave it's not always on me but like i take it personally because i want them to have a great experience so i think you know the care for the kids is most important and when they see that you care about them they'll do things that they didn't know they could do and you didn't know they could do. And I think in my early years, uh, I probably wasn't as good of a technical or tactical coach. And we had kids do amazing things, I think, because they were like, this guy cares about me and no one cared before. 
let's go. And it was just no thought, let's fly, you know? So you know, I, I could go forever, but I'd say, yeah, just a little bit of everything what I said kind of comes together. No, I love it, man. You know, that's so good. You, you mentioned the way I'd put it is you can write it. You can, you can buy a cookbook, but don't mean you're going to open a restaurant. So you, mm -hmm. you can, you can know all the, the, the workouts, right? I mean, almost every coach in this country, you call and say, Hey, what did you do with your miler last year? And they'll like, yeah, here you go. Doesn't mean you're going to have a great miler, right? Like there's so much more into it. You know, the, the plan you talked about laying these bricks by bricks by bricks, uh, you know, uh, building off of each one to build the, the pyramid, if you will, uh, yeah. the care and making sure your athletes know that, you know, your worth is not what time or distance you have on the track. Your worth is who you are and, and being in our program. I mean, that's, that's so good. So good. It's pretty obvious why you got the, the coach of the year award here my friend <laughs> uh you know it, it ain't always about the performances although you had the performances uh it's not always about the care but you had the care but boy you put those together and that's that proverbial one plus one equals three right like you can do more together there man uh and you know just so proud of what you do there at the program mike uh it's obvious that you know your leadership exudes over all of it right the, the whole community, like we talked about from parents and uh, assistant coaches, administration, um, you know, parents don't bring their kids to practice if they don't believe in their coach, right? I mean, it's, it's a whole right. package there, man. So uh, just so proud of what you do there at Union Catholic. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb. Yeah, I'm a betting guy. I, I'm willing to bet that this won't be the last <laughs> Coach of the Year award uh, that you see there at Union Catholic. So Mike, thank, thank you. you so much, man. Appreciate your time today, uh, your wisdom. Uh, we're just so happy to, to kind of just let everybody else know your story, man. It's awesome. You're in, you're in Jersey. We're going to bring you all the way to the West Coast. We're going to let everybody know the great things that you're doing there. Great. Thanks so much. I, I really appreciate you doing this. Absolutely. And thank you for being here and listening today. You know, that's two amazing high school coaches back to back, right? Shelton Irvin down in Summer Creek, down in Texas, Mike McCabe here up in New Jersey uh, and everywhere in between, man, there are just amazing coaches every city around the world and they are creating positive impacts right where their feet are and that is one of the most important things you can do as a track coach you don't have to have some huge platform you don't have to be the head coach of some amazing college and all this stuff the kids that are on your team right now they need you they need you to care they need you to have a plan they need you to figure out how to help them believe in themselves and they can go on and be amazing track athletes lawyers doctors teachers moms and dads that's the impact that you as a track and field coach makes on a daily basis. So thanks for being here and listening today. If you received value from today's conversation, I'm going to go out on a limb and say someone else in your network uh, would receive value as well. And plus, we need to hype these guys up, man. Go share Shelton and Mike's podcast with the world. These are great gentlemen that are leading in our sport. And the more we can uh, kind of show that leadership that they do, we'll all be better for it. So share it on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. I, I, I took a sneak peek at this guy's Twitter. Not very active, so he's not going to share it on Twitter. So I need you to go out and share it on Twitter and all your other uh, social media channels out there. Okay, join us next week. We're going to do it all over again and uh, just uplift and honor another amazing track and field coach. See you next week.